I want to. I want you to start um, by telling the students about basically how it came about that you became a lawyer. You come from a family of lawyers, uh, and uh, I'd like you to tell them a little bit about that. Tell them a little bit about your father uh, and, and basically the road that led you to Mercer. I'm pleased to be here this morning. Good morning. Uh, I was lucky. At the age of 12, I figured out I was not going to be a Major League Baseball player. <laughs> and, uh, so what did I want to do? And, and, and I figured out pretty early I wanted to go to the University of Georgia. I've been a Bulldog fan since I was, knew the difference between a Bulldog and a Yellow Jacket. And, and I wanted to go to the Mercer Law School and, and uh, then be a prosecutor for a little while and then go into private practice. And I knew all that because that's what my dad had done. I was blessed to have a father that, that was just a great role model for me and, and mentor him. We'll talk about mentoring. But, uh, so I knew early on that's what I was going to do. So I didn't apply to but one college, and that was Georgia, and then uh, I knew I wanted to come to Mercer for law school because that's what he had done. And, and he had started a law firm here uh, in the 50s, actually, uh, with Hank O'Neill. So I knew that that would be an opportunity for me in law school to have a place I could work uh, as a law clerk and uh, work with Hank O'Neill and Manley Brown and Lamar Sizemore. I was blessed to have a, a father whose law firm had some of the finest lawyers around and that I would have a chance to work with those guys and learn from them. So that's how I knew I wanted to be a lawyer was early on because my dad did that. Yeah. That's what I wanted to do. And, and I, if we could do it briefly, I'd like you to tell the story of one of your dad's cases. I mean, he had a couple of very famous cases, and uh, I think the Anjet Lyles case is something that everybody that goes to law school in Macon should know, you know, two minutes about. Uh, and the exhibits are on display in the library, as I understand it, uh, right? Yes. Uh, when Mr. O'Neill and my dad started the law firm in 1956, uh, both of them had been prosecutors, and, and uh, Within two years, one of the most famous cases in Macon uh, hit the news when Ann Jet Lyles, who ran the cafeteria downtown, where all the downtown folks like to go eat, including Dad, uh, was charged with the, the murder of her daughter. Uh, and she died a horrible death, uh, and as it turned out, the, her mother had poisoned her with arsenic. Uh, and if you know anything about arsenic, you have to give it in small doses over a period of time for it to to work in a big dose all at once, the body will throw it off. And so she had been given poison to her daughter uh, for some weeks that led to her death. And, and upon her death, uh, uh, the authorities uh, went back and, uh, as it turned out, she had murdered two husbands and a mother-in-law uh, before she murdered her, her daughter. And the earlier deaths uh, were thought just to be this tragedy for Ann Jeff because one thing about arsenic, not everybody that's a victim of that dies the same way. It's not something that just by the way they die, you suspect arsenic. And so they went back and exhumed the bodies, and uh, indeed there was arsenic in, in them. And, and so uh, the, the district attorney at the time, who my dad had worked for, was distantly related to Ann Jett, so he was disqualified uh, from, from prosec prosecuting her, so he got the attorney general to appoint dad and, and Mr. O'Neill to be special prosecutors in the case. And, and back then, death penalty cases went from, because they sought the death penalty, and the jury awarded the death penalty. Back then, from arrest to trial was six months. You think about that today, a death penalty case from arrest to trial is years, and then if the penalty's ever imposed, it might be 20 years, but it was a very different world back then. But they were, uh, became the special prosecutors, and in the case attracted international attention. Uh, they had talked about, in the evenings, there'd be reporters here from London and Paris, and, and of course New York and around the country that wanted to hear all about the case. And so they'd spend some time in the evening with the reporters, but, but they prosecuted a, a great case. Uh, she was found guilty of murder and uh, sentenced to the, to the death penalty, but uh, it was never carried out because later, uh, governor appointed a panel of psychiatrists as they did it in Georgia prohibits the execution of an insane person and as they use that term back then and 
the three psychiatrists decided that she was insane and she went over to Central State Hospital where she died. But that case put this young firm on the map and, and within two years they were involved in another case, Chester Burge, uh, who murdered his wife and I don't really have time to get into that in much detail but uh, for me the interesting thing is both of these cases later resulted in a book being written about them uh, in the last ten years. And both of those cases have resulted in a TV <coughs> segment being done about it. AD <coughs> did a segment on the Ann Jett case uh, that I got interviewed for for some odd reason, just because I'm the son of the prosecutor. What's, what's that qualify me for? But, but, and I actually made the final cut. So if you ever catch the AD, <laughs> City Confidential, um, that series, they take a famous crime from a city and feature the city and the crime, and it was quite interesting. But, I'm going to New York two weeks to be interviewed on the Chester Burge case uh, for a uh, production company going to put this film together that will be aired on the Discovery Channel. And I'll make the final cut. My dad's two biggest cases will result in many, many years later, 50 years later, his son being on the TV. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it put them on the map, and they later had a great run as a firm in this town. If I remember correctly, ironically, and yet you had poisoned four people in that. Uh, became uh, the cook at the uh, <laughs> at the hospital. So rumor had it over at Central State, she worked in the kitchen. Uh, I had a lawyer, Frank McKinney, uh, who was kind of like a local legal historian. So that really wasn't true, but uh, it, it got repeated so often it uh, it's was accepted as truth. It's too good of a story. Too good of a story, yes. Um, why don't you uh, sketch for the students what your career was between the time you graduated and the time you went on Bench. If, I, if I remember correctly, you were elected around 2000, is that? 1998. 1998, okay. So between graduation and 1998, uh, why don't you give them a feel for the kinds of things that you did? Well, I knew I wanted to be a prosecutor, and I decided that, that federal prosecution was what I wanted to do. And, and timing is everything in life, and uh, uh, the U.S. Attorney's Office was here in the Middle District, you know, was in a time of transition. Uh, after the election in 76, uh, it just takes time for the political process to work to get the appointment of a new U.S. attorney. And so I had to wait for the new U.S. attorney, Lee Rampey, to get uh, selected, appointed, and then I applied with him. So I had a short period of time in my dad's firm right out of law school and then uh, started in the U.S. attorney's office about a year and a half after graduation and then worked there for almost eight years. And, that was a lot of fun. I got to say, as a young prosecutor, I had, I, I considered the good fortune to go into that office about the time that drug smuggling cases were getting uh, pursued. And that was because uh, the smuggling pattern of the time was to fly small airplanes to South America and bring them back in, among other places, South Georgia, because there are a lot of rural places. And we had a run there where we were catching these airplanes on a regular basis. Uh, and, once you caught them, then that would lead to uh, investigation. The pilots often would end up being excellent witnesses because uh, they had to be pretty sharp guys to get in the airplane and fly to South America and, and bring back uh, overloaded coming out of jungles. I could tell you some incredible stories these guys told me, uh, but the, we prosecuted a lot of smuggling cases, and I was the first organized crime drug enforcement task force attorney for the Middle District of Georgia. Uh, that was just getting started because of the reason that the drug smuggling was such a big deal. And, and for a while there, Georgia was in a hotbed of it. We caught so many planes and worked some fascinating cases. And, and the thing about the U.S. Attorney's Office for me was it was the pure practice of law. I didn't have to worry about overhead and hiring and paying staff and uh, what the order for the library, I, none of that. I just, all I did was work cases. And back then, the assistant U.S. attorneys were given a lot more latitude than they are now. I mean, we handled our cases. The U.S. attorney said to me, you handle your case. If you need me, come talk to me. But otherwise, I trust you to do your job. And, and, and it was a lot of fun. And had some great cases. I prosecuted a bank robbery case. These folks were going all over the southeast to picking out uh, banks to rob. And uh, they later one in the middle district of Georgia and uh, then got caught and uh, they went to a jury trial and the ringleader was the uh, woman who, uh, Samantha Lopez, who got a 50-year prison sentence after being <coughs> guilty in that trial and, uh, and was involved in the first ever 
helicopter escape from a federal prison. <laughs> she uh, she was a clad artist, and she got into prison and in Lompoc, California, that the men and the women could uh, be together during the day, and she convinced this helicopter pilot that they were in love. And, uh, and so he escaped, stole a helicopter, flew into the compound, picked her up, and away they went. And, uh, and within a week, they went into a jewelry store in San Francisco to buy a ring, and the clerk there recognized them from the news report. And so they weren't on the land very long. Uh, but I got interviewed about that, the local reporters that got back. Hey, you, you prosecuted that woman. Uh, Yo, I remember her well. Uh, we were getting strange calls at my home, and the FBI set up uh, monitoring our phone calls at home. We were getting some threatening calls. My wife was not happy about two little kids at the house. I've known you for 15 years, I never heard that story. <laughs> I've got a few you haven't heard. <laughs> but the, but the, you, being a federal prosecutor was a lot of fun. And, but at some point I wanted to go back and practice with my dad. That was my goal, as I said earlier, to go back into private practice. And I did that for about 12 years and enjoyed it. You get to do the diverse practice. And I, I did criminal, uh, I had done prosecution, did some defense work, criminal, and then on the civil side, I, did some plaintiff's work, some defense work, uh, represented the cab company for a while there, and that was not my favorite thing to do, but, uh, but I had diverse practice and I enjoyed it. And You get to help people, that's really what you're doing, you're just getting paid to help folks get out of the mess they, they're in, however they got there. And, and, uh, but Lamar Sizemore, one of my mentors, uh, who got me into doing uh, the alternative dispute resolution, the ADR, uh, and I took the training and did quite a few mediations, some arbitrations, and I just decided I like playing the role of helping folks get their disputes resolved. And, and maybe a little burnout on private practice, and that side of it that I was talking about earlier, where you, you know, a lot of your day is not spent practicing law, where you're just running a business. And that's what a law firm is, is a business that you must run like a business. And it, uh, I was a managing partner for quite a few years. So. I spent a lot of time, what kind of, you know, computers. I remember when the first word processor came out, you know, and imagine that the, you might have thought they'd been around forever. Uh, but uh, we had electric typewriters, uh, and, uh, and we were impressed when they had that little feature where you could back up and, and white out a letter. Uh, you might have, uh, so word processor. Yeah, but those decisions, uh, the administrative side of running a, a law office, uh, I was just a little burned out in the chance to, maybe touch more people uh, by being a judge because a lot of folks come through the court and I hope I can touch a lot of lives and hopefully in a positive way. And so I decided I wanted to be a, a judge, which my dad had never thought about doing, so I, I deviated there, but he was, was very supportive and uh, I completed four terms. I'm in my fifth term now. I think time's flying. Wait till you get to be 60-something years old, you'll realize this flying even more than you realize. Yeah, and, they'll, and, and they'll be able to say, you know, you kids can't remember when there wasn't an internet. Yeah. That's right. Uh, when we got our first color TV, I mean. You know. We need rocking chairs if we're going to have that conversation. Yeah, really. Yeah. Um, but, but, before we talk about um, the perspective of the judge and all of this, I wonder if you could spend a few minutes talking about your mentors. You know, this, and, what they did for you, and they, they, the students keep hearing this phrase. They keep, you know, and I ask almost everybody who comes th this question. But I wonder if you can talk a little bit about what they meant to you, who they were, and, and how they helped you become the lawyer you became. Well, you know, I was blessed to have, the, as far as I'm concerned, some of the best mentors a law student, young lawyer could ever have. With my dad, the starters, and his partners, who were very successful in. in litigation, which is what appealed to me at the time, and, uh, and I've had some young lawyers come in front of me that I've tried to encourage to get a mentor. I cannot imagine a young lawyer out there without a mentor, and the state bar has now got a program that assures that every new lawyer will have a mentor. If you're in a firm, you'll have them just naturally in the setting where you're working, but some lawyers, uh, some young lawyers want to set up their own practice, and that's, that's fine. It, it's, it's, it's kind of a daunting thing to do to hang out a shingle and say, all right, here I am. Uh, I need to make a living. Come help me do that. I'm sure you've got a problem I can help you with, right? Uh, and, uh, and I've seen some young lawyers that did not have a mentor, and they struggle with the 
all phases of being a lawyer, not just the lawyering side, but the running the office side. One young lawyer, I started getting late for showing up for court, called his office, and his voicemail box was full. I asked him later, I said, do you have a secretary? No, I don't have a secretary. Uh, do you have anybody you can go talk to about problems that come up in your practice? I really don't. I said, you've got to get somebody. I'll do what I can, but find somebody that practices in the same building where you're practicing. Just older lawyers are quite willing to help. I, one phrase I heard at some point that shared at the end of court uh, a couple years ago was, you learn it, you live it, you pass it on. And each phase is important, and when you're learning it, having the mentors, the folks that have been there. In a couple of years, you'll be mentoring the first year law students, right? Uh, what you've learned in your first year, you'll be sharing with the next year's first year students. And, and uh, <coughs> I can't imagine not having mentors and good ones because there are many things you'll encounter that for you, you ain't got a clue. You've never seen this before. You don't know how it's gonna play out. Well, there are plenty of lawyers who've seen it and know how it will play out and are glad to share with you what they experience. I think you'll find that. Just ask. It's a a great They're eager you know, to share what they know with you, so seek them out. It's a great tradition, and it has not been lost, I think. It's been around a long time, and I hope it's never lost. Well, so you run for judge, uh, you get elected. Now, I want to know if there was anything that surprised you uh, when you changed that perspective. Go on behind the bench instead of in front of it. What, what surprised you the most when you became a judge? Well, you, instead of being an advocate in an adversarial system, you're now the one who rules on things. And, and uh, I was struck, one, by the volume of cases that are handled in the state court. Uh, I had a general idea, but not fully, I did not fully appreciate that until I, I got there, and it was just, whoa. Uh, how do I keep up with all this? But uh, uh, the point that my perspective changed on was get to the point. You know, when you're an advocate, sometimes you feel like you've got to say everything you can think of to say on behalf of a client. And, uh, and, and one thing I better appreciate now, I've heard other judges say this, brevity is a virtue. <laughs> uh, you know, get to the point. Uh, Sometimes a rifle shot's a lot more effective than a shotgun approach when there's so many things you throw out there that uh, that good point that's in there gets lost in the shuffle. And so uh, Judge D. Ross Fitzpatrick, uh, who was one of my mentors when I started as a judge, a federal judge, I love that guy. And he had a rule, so I'm told, that if your letter was more than two pages long, it went in a separate stack over here, and uh, he would get to it later. A one-page letter would, uh, was the best way to go, and, and so I, I learned to appreciate that, that you be brief, get to the point. You actually serve your client better doing that. Uh, it's all me, who's your audience in a given situation you're trying to persuade, and uh, with the judge, it's get to the point. I had a conversation Monday with a Superior Court judge who recently retired, and his impression on this point was to say, uh, you know, these lawyers are there, they've got one case that day, it's the most important thing they've got, and I've got 30, right? Yeah. And uh, I've got to keep, keep it moving. Did you have that same... Well, I, used to, I got to do some appellate oral arguments, uh, and I really enjoyed doing that. It was a little intimidating the first few times, but uh, uh, but you, you're exactly right. I'd go up there and i got a case I feel strongly about his own appeal, and I really want to prevail, I want to win, and I want to say something to you that will impress you, <coughs> appellate judges, so at the end of the day, you'll say, yes. And it occurred to me, when I looked at their calendar, they'd have 10 oral arguments that day, or eight, or however many, and you think, that's packing them in. And you figure at the end of the day, they go back there, and they probably don't remember any single thing that happened during the course of the day, and, and there's a young prosecutor, I went to one of our seminars for <laughs> appellate advocacy, and one of the, 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 the Fifth Circuit judge at the time came, and he said, I hate to break the news to you, but what you say in oral argument rarely, if ever, carries the day. It rarely changes the outcome. I said, okay. And so if you, you go say something, just be 
to the point because that gives you the best chance it'll be heard and, and then over to work your side of the case. Yeah, this, the students probably don't know the difference between a state court and a superior court yet. That's, they're, studying, they're studying the federal civil procedure, but uh, not state procedure and state jurisdiction. Can you describe for them just what is it that your court handles? Sure. Uh, in Georgia, the court of general jurisdiction is the superior court, and that's called different things in different states. I think in Florida, it's the circuit court. Right. And, uh, but in Georgia, it's the Superior Court, the, uh, the Court of General Jurisdiction, and, and there's the Superior Courts in every county in the state of Georgia. But state courts came along at some point, and there are only about 70 of the counties that have state courts, uh, and were set up to do misdemeanor cases on the criminal side, and then on the civil side, we have a pretty broad uh, jurisdiction with no monetary limit, uh, but um, certain things are reserved to the Superior Court, like uh, divorce cases, child custody matters, equity jurisdiction, some other things that are, don't come up as often. And, and so if you want to seek injunctive relief, you must go to the Superior Court. But if you want to file a, a civil lawsuit, and it can be a tort, a contract, uh, you know, get a lot of car wreck cases, slip and fall cases, medical malpractice cases, uh, and the, the fact that there's no monetary limit, means we get some great cases to, to hear, and I, I'd always understood that, and I appreciate it even more that lawyers, uh, and it varies, but a lot of counties, the plaintiff's lawyer on the civil side like to file in state court, because in the superior court, they, the felonies dominate, and they have a heavy felony caseload, they, that's, they gotta deal with it, and, and the divorce cases, and, and, and so the state courts, I think, have developed maybe a little more Expertise for handling car wreck cases and these uh, and just the plaintiff's personal injury cases, and, and so we do a lot of that. And that's, I believe, that's the part that appeals to most lawyers who want to become a state court judge is that civil side of the case because we, we get some fascinating cases with a lot at stake. And, 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 and then on the misdemeanor side, it's you just crank them out. I mean, they come in high volume, and, and, uh, and you should approach it as. To each person that comes to court, that's their day in court. And while you're seeing, you know, 100 people in a day, for that one person, that's their one encounter with a judge, maybe the first ever, or something that hopefully happens rarely, although we have some regular customers. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and so you have a chance, and, and everyone, and I'm not naive, some folks come through there and they, they don't get a thing out of the experience, but we see a lot of young folks, folks with, with substance abuse problems, so on the criminal side of the court, we have a chance to make a difference in their life. And, I and, and they can save their life. You said 100 people in a day, and you're not kidding. No, I'm, we've had calendars with, on a, Friday's our big criminal day, and I've had calendars within in excess of 200 people on Yippee Friday. Uh, so efficiency is important, and, and brevity, as I say, is a virtue. And don't come in there and try to get long-winded on a sentencing situation, you know, I, it's just, when, when they say the they, attention span is going to be short because there's uh, 50 more people sitting out there wanting to get up in front of you, and so that's where the lawyer and the defendant, many of whom are not represented. If they start with may it please the court, you tell them to get to the court. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Um, has your perspective on the law changed from being an advocate to being a judge. Now, judge Luke Meyer visited with us several years ago and talked about <coughs> that. That's one of the things he liked about being a judge. Did? Did. Yeah, that, that his, his relationship to the law itself was different. Come to appreciate the important role you play. I, when I started, uh, Judge Phillips, uh, he graduated from Mercer in the 50s and served as the state court judge here for for 33 years you know, before he decided to retire, uh, told me that until the Court of Appeals of the Supreme Court says otherwise, what you say is the law. Well, I never thought about it that way, Judge. Uh, and, uh, but he was right, and you know, and, and uh, very few of the decisions I've made you know, over 16 years now got reviewed on appeal. It just doesn't happen that often. On the criminal side, I've had less than one a year. 
so thousands of people have come through there with I'm the law. And, and, and I take that very seriously. Instead of getting sloppy, I try to have a higher standard because I, I want to be sure that their experience is fair. They feel like they got have a fair day in court. Uh, however brief their appearance might have been, they go away feeling like uh, uh, they've been treated fairly and, and treated right. And, and so that burden of a sort uh, occurs to you at some point. That as an advocate, man, you can just go in there and, and you argue to your side, even if you don't have a lot to work with sometimes, you know. You, the cards are dealt, and sometimes you look and so, say, I want a very good hand here. Uh, but that doesn't stop you from being the advocate for your client, going in there and, and, and getting the most you can out of what you've got to work with. And, uh, but then, and I've heard lawyers say this, and I, they enjoy doing that, but they also like at some point, it's all me, it's on you, Judge. You figure it out. And uh, so you take that very seriously, and because you want to get it right, not just because you hope the court of appeals will agree with you. If it happens to go up on appeal, but because it's just the right thing, and and, and you know, judges are sworn to follow the law, and you know, I think all judges take that very seriously. And, <coughs> Every once in a while, though, you get a case where if I follow the law, somebody, in my opinion, is getting mistreated here, and, and, and that'll weigh on you. You know, I've had some folks. So what do you do? Well, I follow the law, and I try to tell them, and, uh, and it's often the, the, the smaller claims where folks will come in there without a lawyer, and, and they feel very strongly about the situation, but the law says the other side prevails, and, and, uh, and I explain to them, you know, if, this was just me, but trying to do what I thought was the right thing. I'd rule for you. I'll tell them that. But, uh, but you know, I've got to follow the law, even when I don't like it, even when I don't agree with it. And that does happen sometimes. Uh, the court of appeals has pointed it out to me. <laughs> What's your favorite thing about being a judge? What, what, what do you like the most? Helping folks get their disputes resolved. I tell jurors when they come in that, you know, what we do at the courthouse is provide a means of a peaceful and orderly resolution of disputes. If you pause and let that sink in, that's a pretty important part of our society, of our way of doing things in, in this country and in this state and in this county. And, and, uh, and jurors come in on occasion to help us on those disputes that cannot otherwise be resolved uh, to do that. And I try to impress on them the importance of what they do. It's, uh, and I like that part of the job is helping people, litigants, get their disputes resolved in a peaceful and orderly way, and hopefully with them going away feeling like they've been treated fairly. Well, there are a lot of ways to resolve disputes that aren't peaceful or orderly. It, it very much so. And unfortunately, a lot of folks take the law into their own hands, and, and they'll end up uh, most of the time at the courthouse. And, uh, like Judge Sims, if you read the paper, uh, Judge Howard Sims, one of our Superior Court judges, He's prone to get on these young folks. He makes some great points with them, whether they get it or not. Uh, but, but I enjoy that part of the job. That's what drew me to the job, and that continues to be what I enjoy doing. I love to get a set of facts and figure them out and go check the law. And, and when there's a, a well-argued uh, case, uh, each side's well-represented, and it's the uh, a lot at stake, and uh, what does the law say about what the outcome should be here? Trying to figure that out is fun. I enjoy doing that. And, uh, What's the hardest kind of decision you have to make? Unfortunately, the side of being a judge that I'm not like is uh, just going to take. There's a lot of lousy lawyering that goes on, and that it saddens me, and sometimes it hurts the clients. Uh, what you do as a lawyer, it, here it's abstract, right? You get out there, it's concrete. And uh, people's liberty, and in some cases lives, but liberty or fortunes are at stake. And how you handle that case determines the outcome. You'd like to think every case on its merits, every time it's going to come out on the side that has the stronger case. Not necessarily. A well-advocated case that may be the weaker side may prevail over the other side not being so well advocated. And, and so there are rulings I've had to make that the only way to interpret that ruling was that there's been legal malpractice. <coughs> I don't like to do that, but I don't have a choice. I, I tell the law students that have worked with me that 
the Professor Long and his, his sent us, and now the law clerks. We finally got a, the county to approve us having a law clerk. Uh, that one thing about that job is you will see work product from lawyers that you'll look at and say, I could have done a better job than that. And I'm a, I've just done one year of law school, and, and you'd have been right. And, and, and so from that, I tell them, be encouraged that you can get out there one day and be a lawyer and, and, uh, and do a good job. Uh, and so it saddens me that that happens. Because the bar is set so low. Yes. <coughs> like I used to tell my boys, I have three sons, if you get out there and you show up on time to where you're supposed to be, and you're prepared, and you're respectful, you're ahead of about 80% of the population just doing that before you ever get to what it is you're there about. You think about that uh, in life. If I call a plumber and he shows up on time, all right, I like this guy. <laughs> and hopefully he's going to do a good job at a fair price too. But the, uh, it, And the reason it impresses is because, unfortunately, so often that's not what you see. And lawyers are the same way. So... <coughs> Cannot be on time. I, I, I used to have nightmares. When I was a young federal prosecutor, the thought of being late in Judge Owens' court, he was the federal judge here for a long time, and he had a reputation. He was a great judge, and I came to admire him a lot. But as a young lawyer, the, the prosecutor, the other prosecutors would warn me of things. If you, such and such happens, be prepared. You know, he's going to get all over you. And so I over-prepared, and, and I have never late. I, and uh, this, you know, I see lawyers do this for me coming along when the judge said, call your next witness. That witness was out in the hall ready to walk in the courtroom. And I've had lawyers call your next witness. Well, then I hear you. What? Uh, and I've not done what Judge Owens would have done. Well, I take it you rest your case then. Oh, no, no. I've not done that. I've been tempted, but I've not done that. Uh, you know, so just... And be prepared, be on time, and be respectful. And because ultimately, your credibility is the most important thing you've got going for you. And you start working on that uh, early, and, and, it, and it's a constant thing you're working on. And you can work on it, and work on it, and be doing a good job, and then do something stupid that can undermine all of that. They're lawyers I trust that they, and I trust because when they file things, I can rely on it. It's a, it's a good work product. They don't overstate. Uh, if they submit a consent order, I, I don't spend a lot of time looking at it. Uh, I know uh, that they have, uh, it's going to be right. And, and there are other lawyers. I scrutinize everything they submit. I don't take their word for anything. Uh, and it may be it's okay, but I, I'm going to spend a little more time with it. Uh, just because I know that there have been other times they've submitted things that were not right. And, uh, and, and lawyers get themselves in trouble by overstatement. One just the other day, the judge, I have to argue a point, and it's Judge Hanson that had this, but I've seen it too. Uh, well, I've got some, there are a lot of cases uh, that support the position I'm taking here. What do you have them with you? Well, no, but I'll get them to you. And it never happens. And, and you have your law clerk checking and indeed the law goes the other way. Now, you know, when you have adverse authority, the rules actually require you to disclose that to the court. Uh, and, and, and I've had lawyers do that. Well, you're talking about building your credibility. When a lawyer tells me something that hurts their side of the case, their, you know, their credibility. They're just doing what they're supposed to do, but sometimes in the zeal, and you're supposed to be zealous, and that zeal you, and your desire, your competitive nature, you want to win this case, uh, you might uh, overstate something, and it'll come back to haunt you. Almost every time. Uh, so, and one of the points you're making here, you say it saddens you, and I think there's some emphasis. We talk in here, one part of professionalism is competence. I think a lot of first year students hear that and they think, well, of course, I mean, all lawyers are going to be competent. <coughs> and it turns out not to be so. So, I mean, it is worth talking about. You know, when you're a brand new lawyer, uh, and I remember starting out here in private practice, and every lawyer in town had to do appointed criminal work. You had to be on the list. It wasn't voluntary. It was part of the deal. And so within a week of your first 
day on the job and get a call. You've been appointed to represent so and so. And the first client I ever had was Willie Mose Johnson. Uh, and, and he was just an old drunk. And, and he busted out a window in a liquor store to get a pint of liquor to drink uh, sitting down the street. And he was caught shortly thereafter. And go in there and, and the prosecutor, oh, yeah, oh, Willie, we've been seeing him for years. <laughs> and uh, he said, well, this is the first time I've met him, and uh, I want to do a good job for him. And, uh, and you think, what do I know? I took criminal law in law school, and, and law school's important. Get everything you can out of it. But the real education truly begins when you get out there and sitting in the DA's office. One of the lawyers was looking at the file, and I was looking at the file. And said, Have you filed your Brady motion yet? What is a Brady motion? <laughs> <laughs> Does anybody here know what a Brady motion is? Probably not yet. No, they do because we do a case study. Well, Brady v. Maryland, the, the state's obligated to disclose its sculptor information on your client. And, uh, and so I went back to the office and drafted up a Brady motion and filed it shortly thereafter. And then I filed it in every case, right? I mean, and, and that's another example. Lawyers, again, are glad to share forms. I, Ed Garland was one of the best defense lawyers and criminal defense lawyers in the state in Atlanta. He's still at it, but, uh, but his form by, got plagiarized by about every federal criminal defense lawyer I ever saw. I'd see the motions coming in, I, Garland's, uh, that's a high form of flattery, right, or something, the uh, imitation. imitation of him. And, uh, and so was I competent then? <coughs> That's when you go to folks and you've been doing it. Help me out here. This is the way I see it. Am I right? No, you need to do this. Okay, go do it. Let's take it very seriously. This client's liberty is in your hands and you've got to do a good job. And, but you have to start somewhere. But that's to get back to the mentors. Right, and then effort and humility will carry you a long way. Go get acquainted with the deputy clerks in the courts you practice and treat them kindly. Some young lawyers come in there and they're arrogant with them. <laughs> Wrong. Don't do that. Uh, these ladies can help you if you just a kind word goes a long way. Good manners uh, applies uh, everywhere you go. In yeah, any setting you find yourself in, good manners gets you down the road. I was trained to go in there and just look pathetic, and then they would help me. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good approach. They like, want to help. I mean, they're glad to help. That's what they do for. And they know more about certain things than you know. You may have a law degree, but they've been processing legal papers for years. Other than what you talked about, are there any other pet peeves you've got, big or little, about the way lawyers conduct themselves? Well, being late, uh, being unprepared. I had a lawyer come in one time on a hearing and uh, said, so, uh, what do you have? Well, I'm going to stand on my brief. Well, I'd already read the brief, and it was one of the worst briefs I've ever read. <laughs> Are you serious? <laughs> no. Bad question from a judge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a, a clue that you know, I felt sorry for him, actually. But uh, the senior lawyer sent him in, and it wasn't fair to the young lawyer. But uh, just being unprepared, when we try cases, I mean, you should go into a trial. And I've tried a lot of cases, and I tell lawyers this, you know. It's something as picky as having your exhibits marked and ready and shown to opposing counsel so we don't spend time in the courtroom uh, with you fumbling around. I've had lawyers come up to the court reporter, you got any exhibit stickers up here? Well, they usually do. Uh, what's my next number? And the jury sitting there watching it. It's irritating the heck out of the judge, but it's also not making a very good impression on those folks sitting over there that will decide your case. Jurors notice these things. It's not just when you're in a trial, the words spoken from the witness stand that matter. Uh, you're on the stage out there, and everything you do is being watched by those jurors. And if you're prepared, you'll come across as prepared and impress jurors. Again, independent of the merits of the matter, uh, you're making a good impression that you're here, you're prepared, you're respectful, uh, you help move things along, you get to the point. Jurors appreciate that, too. And... Uh, and so unprepared lawyers, late lawyers, cell phones have, of course, become an issue. I see lawyers pull them out sometimes in good manners, and I guess we're developing our manners, our etiquette for cell phones. Uh, 
because they are everywhere and uh, and they they're important. I accept that. I have one. And I use it daily. My children taught me how to text. Uh, they would not answer the phone, but if I texted them, I'd get an immediate response. So I, it, it'd take them long to figure out that's what I should do. But, but there's a place for them, and there's a place where they shouldn't be. I've had lawyers and hearings pull them out and start looking at them. You're kidding me. Uh, don't do that. It's, it's bad manners it, it, when you're out to eat, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, we were out the other night, there were four young folks, probably seniors in high school, give or take. And every one of them would just conversate. <laughs> the art of conversation is being lost. And, uh, everybody agrees with me on that, don't you? What happens when a cell phone goes off in your car? Uh, we take it and it costs them $25 to get it back. <laughs> and they fuss about it. <laughs> you can't do that. I, can't, I don't have $25. Well, I'm sorry. They always find a way. <laughs> Every time. Do I remember right that you once find yourself twenty-five dollars? Uh, I have not done that. I've, I've thought about it, uh, and I've heard of that being done, and I've, I've threatened to do it. The one time I was about to do it, though, it turned out it was a lawyer's phone that was ringing and not mine. <laughs> but you were prepared. To find I, was, I said, "I'm glad it was you, but not me." I want to just ask you one last thing, uh, and that is the same question I ask everybody that comes. You have a captive audience. Almost all first-year law students have a few transfers. Is there anything you think they need to hear that maybe you would have wanted to hear when you were a first-year <coughs> law student? It's a, it's a free shot, Judge. What, what do you think they need to hear? Well, this is not a, a new phenomenon, but you feel like you're in a hurry. You want to get out of law school, get to work, get to your job. My dad, when he went to commercial law school, back then you did not have to have a law degree to become a lawyer. And you could take the bar before you graduated. And he had, there was a, and a bunch that had been off to World War II. And he served in Europe. And uh, he got back, so I'd go to law school. And the law school went from closed down for a couple of years during World War II to after the war, having all these guys coming back. And they were all in a hurry, and uh, the bar results were posted, and, and I, I know this happened. My dad saw that he had passed. He got up, walked out, and said, see you later. I'm out of here. Uh, and, uh, and went on to have a great career, but he didn't actually get his law degree. Uh, and, uh, so slow down. Law school will be over before you know it, believe it or not. I've been out almost 38 years, and it's like I can't believe that. I have very distinct and fond memories of being in law school and make friends here. You'll encounter fellow classmates sometimes <coughs> soon, but sometimes years later you'll run across an old classmate. So make friends of everybody here. That's, that's a certain competitive aspect of law school, I know, but uh, make friends. Take it all in. Savor what you're going through now. You'll, get, you'll be out before you know it, and you'll have that whole career ahead of you. Uh, but make the most of your time in law school. Uh, <clears throat> take on things that, if you want to be a trial lawyer, take you know trial practice and uh, those classes where you can try cases. and Go watch trials uh, every chance you get. Uh, you think you want to be a trial lawyer. Uh, <clears throat> you have a chance now to do some things, and once you get your career started, it's going to be hard to do. I, start your practice and go there and just watch a trial. That's what I tell our law students and law clerks. Just come in here and watch a trial. If you think you want to be a trial lawyer, uh, there's a lot of things you can do to prepare for that, but one of them is just watching good lawyers try their cases and see what works and what doesn't work. So you have a chance while you're in law school uh, to do those kinds of things. And, and, uh, so just take your time. Don't rush things. Enjoy. Is anybody looking at me funny now? <laughs> Enjoy law school. I'm serious. It's actually a, it's a great time of your life. I mean, to study the law in this abs you know, it's, it's in an abstract way. But some of the principles you're working on that seem abstract at some point, I've had this come up with lawyers. We talk about it. You know, I remember studying this in law school, and it didn't mean a whole lot to me. But now, the outcome of this case turns on how this principle gets applied in the, to these facts. And, uh, and so... 
That's what I was saying. Joey Law School. Okay. <laughs> All right, what questions do we have for the judge this morning? Yes, sir. Um, the, uh, that decision making process and that transition from private practice into going uh, on the bench and, and getting into the political arena and um, kind of adjusting to something that maybe you weren't really focused on. You know, during your practice time, uh, but now having to you know consider that aspect to you know set up uh, a campaign and you know to, to garner support and you know voters and things like that. How do you how do you go about that? How do you address that? Um, you know, from from your position, how do you step back from practice and and go in that direction? Really? Well, in Georgia, of course, the judges are elected. Uh, Four-year terms, appellate court terms, like six-year terms, and a lot of judges got into office initially by appointment by the governor, uh, but some had to run. In my case, judge uh, to run for either an open seat or, or challenge an incumbent judge, uh, uh, which is can be risky. Uh, uh, but when I decided to run, Judge Phillips decided he would complete his term and throw it out to the voters and and. Uh, and so I jumped in early, and in fact, Lamar Sizemore, I went to Lamar and said, would you be my campaign director? Because he was my close friend and had been my mentor and one of the most respected lawyers in town. And so uh, I got, as soon as the announcement was made, uh, I jumped in and sent a letter out to all the lawyers. I'm running. I hope you'll support me. And, and, uh, and some other lawyers were interested in running. I found out who they were. They were friends. I called them and said, you know, if you want to run, that's great. Well, have a very positive campaign, and qualifying day arrived, and the, the deadline arrived, and nobody else qualified. So either nobody else wanted the job, or what I like to think, uh, I, I felt like I had a good re relationship with the members of the Macon Bar, and in uh, and the, the letter that Judge Sizemore, Lamar, sent out for me, produced a lot of positive responses, and that raised a, a lot of money just right off the bat, and I'd like to think that might have chilled some other folks' uh, willingness to jump in, but they saw I had a good jump and get a good response. And, and so I've not ever had a challenger. I've uncontested for open seat uh, and then four more elections. With, so I have not had to set up the campaign committee, but a lot of judges go through that, and we the JQC, the Judicial Qualifications Commission, there's a lot of rules about running campaigns, and it used to be a judge could never ask somebody for money. Well, I, somehow the First Amendment, is it the First Amendment? Some notion came along, well, it's okay <laughs> for judges running for re-election or folks running for, to ask lawyers for money. And so the rules have changed a lot, but I've been thankful over these years that I did not have to worry about that. I, I've just been very blessed throughout my career to not have to run a contested election. I was ready for it and prepared for it. I've been in Bibb County my entire life and I was fully prepared to state my case and go out and maybe meet some folks in my community that I did not already know and and, uh, and be better off for the process. I don't know if that answers your question. Yes, sir. thank you. Yes, ma'am. We talk a lot about civility and just picking up the phone to call other attorneys before we start, you know, shooting off motions and and things like that. Um, what's Please kind of your reaction to attorneys who don't? I mean, who, well, again, yeah, it's and they your spoken. credibility, your reputation as a lawyer, uh, you're building that, and, and, and those discovery is an area where it comes up a lot of times. You know, lawyers uh, get crossways. And, uh, and one thing I tell young lawyers, answer all of your discovery on time. If you have a legitimate reason for needing an extension, most likely the other lawyer will agree to it, and you don't have to get the court involved. But the better practice is just do it on time, and so that you don't constantly find yourself, and there's some lawyers that constantly are asking for extensions, and the lawyers know who they are, and finally you'll just say, no, I'm not going to give you an extension. <coughs> You're going to have to ask the judge. And so I'll see these disputes and situations where I'm looking at the lawyers, why couldn't you work this out? Well, one side or the other might not have been particularly civil about it, and, and, uh, and that unpreparedness, you know, not being on top of things, not being ahead of things, eventually puts you in a bad way with another lawyer who maybe, and, and the issue comes up, well, 
I'm agreeable to it, but does the client have a say so? And we don't have time to really develop that, but you'll be confronted sometimes with questions of working with the other lawyer, and you want to do that because you want the other lawyers to work with you when you have needs come up. But, but do I need to get my clients okay to do this? Uh, but civility is important. Uh, good manners, I've already talked about. It. Good manners, being respectful, and, uh, so it does matter, and it is helpful the lawyers to sort things out. I was told early on, judges hate discovery disputes, and I agree. <laughs> I've had discovery disputes where the lawyers couldn't agree on anything, and we go through long interrogatories, item by item, and the objections sometimes were just ridiculous, quite frankly, but uh, they, they got a canned response that still keeps. And that sometimes doesn't get challenged, but eventually it does. It, well, wait a minute, that's not a valid objection. What are you talking about? I've got one right now on a statement that a witness, uh, a, a plaintiff, gave to the insurance company, uh, the adjuster, and, and the defense lawyer doesn't want to let them have it. You know, I was a young federal prosecutor, by golly, defense lawyers weren't going to get anything that I did not have to give them under the federal rules. <laughs> You know, and, uh, and not a moment sooner than I had to give it. And later on, I just figured out, if I just give you everything I've got in advance, and I go into the courtroom and still beat you about the head and shoulders, that's more satisfying for me. Because you've had it. You've had time. So why play these games? You know, that's what I finally decided as a young prosecutor. Here, you have whatever I'm obligated to give you sooner than I'm obligated to give it to you. And because in the end, there it is. I mean, you as an advocate go in and, and do the, what you can with it and hope that it's enough for your side of the case. But the good manner, civility goes a long way. The lawyers know who they are and judges learn who they are that don't do that. Yes, ma'am. How frequently do you encounter unethical and or unprofessional behavior? And when you do encounter that, um, what, how do you address that situation? Well, a lot goes on that the judge does not necessarily see. I know I read depositions sometimes in the you know, context of summary judgment motion. And I'm reading it. The lawyers were just, you know, misbehaving, I'll call it, in the deposition. I, I was not asked to get involved, and, and uh, I was thankful, but, uh, but sometimes I am. I mean, you know, the, you know, the ethical rules are, are more, you know, you must do this or you must not do this. And, and frankly, I have not had much of, of a problem with ethical pro issues coming up that I saw and had some occasion to be uh, ruling on or having some role with. I just, but professionalism does come up, and, and again, often in the discovery context when lawyers just aren't doing what they ought to do. And I mean, being responsive, being uh, doing what you're supposed to do, you have a well, an ethical duty to do that, and professionalism demands that you take it to a higher standard uh, because ultimately your client benefits and, and your reputation as a lawyer benefits. But you know, the, the state bar is there. I've had occasions where I'm thinking, you know, this lawyer needs to be reported to the state bar. And, you know, I haven't done it yet, um, and as it's turned out, some of them, others were reporting them because. Uh, it wasn't just something I was seeing, it was playing out with all their clients, it seemed. And, and, uh, some lawyers I know later face sanctions for that, but I don't have much occasion to rule on it any direct way. I do see some things that bother me, as I'm saying. Yes. Last week we spoke a lot about pro bono work and the great need for attorneys to step up to represent low income clients. How do you feel that attorneys who work pro bono, it, does their work differ from other attorneys quality-wise? And do you feel like low-income, unrepresented people are really disadvantaged in the courts? Do I hear an objection to a compound question? <laughs> Please put it up. Old habits die hard. Pro bono work is critical. I mean, there are a lot of folks who cannot afford to hire a lawyer. And, and the, the lawyers that do that, and there's some in our town that do a lot of it, some do some, a little bit. Our Georgia Legal Services program here locally is a great office. We've got some friends there and I've always supported them. 
uh, and they have a lot of lawyers they can call on when cases come in there that the and they will be getting lawyers who are very competent and capable and will do what it takes to handle that case just like they would a patient <coughs> client. Um, so uh, you do see some cases, you know, with the unrepresented clients. That the, you know, on the one hand, some of the case law says, Judge, you, you can't give them a break just because they're unrepresented. But then there's some other cases that kind of give you a little room as a judge to, to try to Okay, I'm not going to be as strict uh, on certain things with you, but uh, I would commend to all of you at some point to do pro bono work as a part of your practice, uh, to one degree or another. Seek out the, whatever local lobbyist that, that provides those services, and they'll get you hooked up with the folks in need. And, and you know, selfishly, that gives you a chance, as a young lawyer particularly, to maybe get to know some folks and impress this person who goes back and tells all their family, Hey, you need a lawyer. Go call so and so. I mean, so it's a little. It's not all altruistic. It's a little selfish angle in there. But that's okay. As long as you're doing them a good job, and uh, and, and you should do that. And I don't know what else I can tell you, but it's uh, important to our uh, community that there are lawyers that do pro bono work. Well, sometimes you'll be doing pro bono work when you didn't set out for it to be pro bono work. You quote a fee, and they pay it, and then the case. Uh, <laughs> Uh, that'd go the way you hoped and thought you'd work something out and you're sitting, I had a few of those, and you're going into a jury trial, I need some more money, uh, and it doesn't come. And, and, and back then, I understood the judges would say, you're in it, don't file a motion to withdraw. Uh, I see those. Uh, client has not paid fee. <clears throat> okay. Well, you know, we've got a lot of other things to talk about, we're just about out of time. One thing I just want to mention that I wish we had had a chance to talk about, that you have been, in addition to everything else we've talked about, deeply involved in community activity. In fact, the State Bar gave you an award a few years ago for your community service through Little League and church and, and everything else. And so for the students who have a chance to chat with you privately, and I'm hoping you're going to be able to stay around for a few minutes now. I can do that. Uh, who are interested in how you did that and why you thought it was so important. And I would urge you to come talk to the judge about that. It's a huge part of his life. It's a huge part of what I admire about him. Uh, and I wish we'd had time really to talk about it, but we, we ended up talking about the law in a whole hour. So uh, there's a lot more to you than just the law. So uh, join me in thanking the judge. For that.